Welcome to this presentation for the 2016 Graduate Mentorship Program. This presentation is going over in detail what we do when we don't know how to diagnose. It's important to go over these in detail so that we become aware in our daily clinic life of our habits when we come up against that wall that we don't know how to diagnose this patient. When we become aware of these habits, then we're more likely to start applying the newfound skills that we'll be working with in this program as opposed to unconsciously doing these habitual uh, methods. So in the next slide, we'll start going over what these what these things are that we do when we don't know how to diagnose. What do we do when we don't know how to diagnose? Here's a list of things we do when we don't know how to diagnose. I'm going to go over this list and then go over it again in a lot more detail, giving examples of what we do. Number one, we jump to conclusions and make a case for it. Number two, we go to resource books and try to quote, find, unquote, our patient. Number three, we focus on a part and give a formula for that. Number four, we skip the diagnosis and go right to treatment. Number five, we decide on a diagnosis, ignoring the intake. So continuing on with what we do when we don't know how to diagnose, number six is we use a Western diagnosis to draw a Chinese medical conclusion. Seven, go to obscure classics looking for hints. Eight, go to other modalities because we feel Chinese medicine will be inadequate. Nine, skip parts of the intake we can't deal with. 10, diagnose our patient with everything. 11, create formulas that cover our bases in case we're wrong. 12, use vague language. 13. Treat conservatively because we lack confidence. 14. Very simplistic diagnosis and treatment. 15. Blame the patient for not responding. And 16. Get discouraged about Chinese medicine. The final thing that happens when we don't know how to diagnose is that we feel really badly about ourselves. And that's probably the worst. It can be just uh, very depressing and we've put so much into our educations and so much hope into this uh, way of making a living and to have the results be bad and to have our diagnosis be confusing can really make us feel terrible. So number one is that we jump to conclusions and make a case for it. This means that we get an idea about what the diagnosis is early in the intake and we start to see all the incoming information in relation to a diagnosis we decided at the very beginning. And it's actually really easy to make a case, make a good case for a diagnosis that may be completely wrong. So we'll see that in this case. So as we're going through the case, look at what the practitioner is doing and seeing, uh, see if you can determine where the practitioner is jumping to conclusions. So this is a female, age 34, main complaint, cold belly. I have a new patient with a main complaint of a cold belly. Right away, I'm thinking yang deficiency. Her lower belly and around her navel feels cold to the touch, subjectively cold to her as well. She's a robust young woman, though she does have dark circles under her eyes. Hmm, more kidney stuff. I ask about other issues, and the only other problem area is her digestion. Her appetite is poor. She tends to have a sense of stuckness and slow metabolism. Oh, it seems that the spleen chi is weak, too. Pretty common scenario. Kidney yang deficiency with spleen chi deficiency. Wow, I think. I'm good. So take a moment here and see if you can write down where this person jumped to some conclusions that might not be true. Okay, this patient's tongue is large with some greasy moss. It must be that the spleen chi deficiency is leading to some dampness, but that's secondary. because She's thinking the spleen chi deficiency comes first and the dampness is a branch. 
Her pulse is pretty normal, so I give her herbs to strengthen her kidney yang and spleen qi, which include ganjiang and fuzi, to warm her up. When this patient takes her herbs, she breaks out in cold sores and feels uncomfortably feverish. I'm so confident in my diagnosis that I decide it's a healing crisis and encourage her to continue her herbs. A week later, she develops the first migraine headache she's ever had, cancels her next appointment with me, determined never to try Chinese medicine again. So here we revisit this case without jumping to conclusions and making a case for it. If we approach the symptoms in this way, there's a cold belly and that just means cold in the lower belly. Dark, circle un dark circles under the eyes is poor circulation under the eyes. Poor appetite, poor transformation and transportation. Slow metabolism, poor transformation and transportation. Then we have a large tongue is dampness and the greasy moss is damp phlegm. So what we know for sure is that there's dampness and damp phlegm. And that we can go back and explain why there might be a poor appetite and slow metabolism. Can we also say that the dampness and damp phlegm could create cold in the lower belly? Yep. And also the dark circles under the eyes. Um, now this is a... Um, an interesting point, but um, if you read the book Fluid Physiology and Pathology, you can see that one of the symptoms of uh, phlegm is that you get dark circles under your eyes. So we don't want to jump to a conclusion about that being kidney deficiency. Certainly dark circles can come under the eyes with kidney deficiency, but that's by no means the only reason to have those dark circles. So we have a diagnosis here of damp phlegm obstructing the spleen and stomach and the flesh in the lower body. So for treatment, I gave her Wendantong. So this is a case that actually came to me and she had had the treatment, the previous treatment before coming to me. And I could understand why the practitioner came to the diagnosis they came to. But here I want to really point out um, the ways that this practitioner made a decision at the very beginning and then all the evidence piled up to support that decision that she made, that conclusion that she jumped to. It's very easy to do this, to start sorting information relative to a diagnosis that you want to be true or that you've decided is true. And then other things like the damp and phlegm, she decided that was um, due to the spleen deficiency and kidney yang deficiency, so she wouldn't she would let it resolve by itself once she tonified the kidney yang and the spleen qi. So we actually see that there are no spleen qi or kidney yang deficiency symptoms here, not a one. Um, so we would need to see some signs that told us for sure the spleen was deficient or that the kidney was deficient, and that's what we'll be learning in the class. So this is an example of jumping to a conclusion and making a case for it, which is something we do when we don't know how to diagnose. Number two on our list is that we go to a resource book to try to quote, find, unquote, our patient. This is actually something that many students have been taught to do in school. In fact, this is taught as the way to diagnose. You do your intake, and then you go to the book and try to find your patient. And I want to show here, as we go through this case with Anne, how and why this is a completely inadequate method for coming to a diagnosis and treating a patient. To sort of deconstruct what actually goes on when we go to the book. So we can see that we will never be a very effective diagnostician and therefore practitioner if we solely rely on going to the book to try to find our patient. So in this case, we have Anne. She's a 32-year-old social worker. She has a slim body type, rosy cheeks, and bright eyes. When we met, she shook my hand with strength and met my eyes with hers. Anne has come to me with a main complaint of constipation. This is a chronic condition of about seven years. It came on slowly when she was in graduate school, 
she began moving her bowels every two days instead of every day. This extended to every three or four days within one semester that was especially intense. When Anne does move her bowels, the stool is often loose, like diarrhea, with occasional undigested food in it. Other times, the stool is dry and difficult to pass. At the time of our first meeting, Anne moves her bowels every four to five days. Sometimes she takes senna tea to get things going. Her belly often feels full and distended. Anne also complains of fatigue, though she sleeps eight hours a night, usually. She feels draggy a lot of the day and often wants to and does take a 20 minute nap. Her busy schedule, with her busy schedule, this is often difficult to do. Sometimes she will nap instead of having lunch. Other times she's so hungry after missing breakfast that she can't miss lunch. Anne often misses breakfast, but has a muffin or croissant around 11. Then she eats on the road around two, a sandwich. Dinner is often out as well, or she will make a quick batch of pasta at home and eat while watching TV. Anne describes her appetite as poor, though sometimes she's famished to the point of dizziness. When Anne gets her menses, they are often late, up to 35 days. She feels moody, especially irritable, up to five days before she gets her menses. She describes her periods as normal, though they often start with some brown spotting for two days. She takes a couple of ibuprofen on day one. The blood is darkish to start, but then turns red. Anne tends to have dry skin that gets itchy in the winter. Her hands and feet get very cold. In general, Anne runs cold, though she occasionally has a night sweat in which she wakes up hot, sweats, and then gets chilled. Anne tries to exercise six days a week. She either runs or works out in the gym and considers herself fit, wondering why she feels so tired. If Anne doesn't work out, she feels just plain awful and even has even more fatigue and fuzzy thinking. Anne's pulses are thin and deep in general. Her tongue is a normal color, but it has a slightly dark cast and indented sides. There are some red dots in the tip and sides. So now we'll call the symptoms from that intake into a list of Anne's symptoms. So she has constipation. It's sometimes dry, sometimes diarrhea, with fullness and distension. She has irregular eating, which is an important factor, though it's not a symptom. She has a poor appetite, fatigue that's worse with no exercise, late menstruation, premenstrual irritability, dysmenorrhea, brown blood, spotting, dry, itchy skin, cold hands and feet, night heat with sweating, a thin, deep pulse, her tongue is dark with indented sides, and there are red dots on the tip and sides. So even from this, we want to pay attention to the fact that this could be quite confusing, you know, that there's a lot of uh, symptoms that seem to go off in a variety of different directions. Now what we're going to do is approach Anne's case with the idea that we're going to go to the books and try to look for Anne. So we're going to do what I'm saying we do when we don't know how to diagnose. And so we go to the text and try to find our patient. And we're going to do this in quite a lot of detail. And this is really to show really why this doesn't work for us, why we get confused when we try to go to the book to look for our patients. So as we go through this, there are some things that I would like you to notice. One is notice which symptoms correspond to Anne's presentation. With an eye to the fact that Anne's symptoms run the gamut of patterns, that if we go to the book, we'll see that there are symptoms from heat, there are symptoms from blood deficiency, there are symptoms from chi stagnation. So it's very difficult to actually just find our patients because we go and say, well, my patient has this, these symptoms that run the gamut of all of these patterns. So we just want to notice that as we go through. Then also notice that there are symptoms that are repeated from one pattern to the next. Um, so that also shows us that there are many symptoms that really don't help us differentiate what the pattern is because they could be in a variety of 
different patterns. And then finally, notice the symptoms that might be unique to a particular pattern. What is it that tells us that the, this is, for example, liver heat or yang ming heat? Is there something, is there, are there some symptoms that are actually unique to that pattern? So if we go to the book and try to find our patient, then this is what we will end up finding. Now, these patterns were taken from Giovanni's practice of Chinese medicine, as well as the practical therapeutics book. So what we see first is the constipation from liver heat. In this case, we will see dry stool, infrequent bowel movements, thirst, dark urine, headache, bitter taste, irritability, red face, bloodshot eyes, tongue redder on the sides, dry yellow coating, pulse wiry and rapid. So we can see here that right away we see some things that Anne has. She has dry stool, infrequent bowels. She also has premenstrual irritability. We wonder, does that count? And her tongue has red spots on the side. It isn't just red on the sides, but there are red spots on the side. So does that count? So um, next we go to the constipation from Yang Ming He, dry stools, infrequent bowel movement, thirst, scanty dark urine. Okay, we see all of these are repeated from the constipation from liver heat. So what becomes clear is that these symptoms don't help us differentiate between these two patterns. And then we have red face, also the same as the constipation from liver heat, abdominal pain, dry mouth, foul breath. The tongue is red with a yellow coating and red points around the center and on the root. The pulse is rapid and slippery. Then we have constipation from acute heat in a febrile disease. Again, constipation, dry stool, thirst, abdominal pain and fullness, red face, high fever, dry mouth, profuse sweat, feeling of heat, the tongue is red with a dry yellow coating, the pulse is overflowing and rapid. Okay, then we have chi stagnation constipation. Constipation with stool shaped like pebbles, but not dry. So then we think, well, Anne doesn't really have that. A desire to open the bowels, but difficulty in doing so. Belching, abdominal distension, irritability. The tongue may be normal color or slightly red on the sides. The pulse is wiry or wiry on the left side. Then in practical therapeutics under chi stagnation constipation, it says constipation, frequent belching, sensation of stuffiness and blockage of the chest and hypochondrium, reduced food intake and abdominal distension and pain in severe cases. The tongue has a thin slimy coating and the pulse is wiry. So I wonder if you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is, geez, how do you tell? Um, and the difference between what practical therapeutic says and also what the practice of Chinese medicine says. There's variation. Um, and again, we see that uh, Anne has some of these symptoms and doesn't have others of these symptoms. So now we're going to look at the deficiency patterns that are in the practice of Chinese medicine text. So we have Qi deficiency constipation, a desire to open the bowels, but difficulty doing so, and great effort to open the bowels. Um, in my experience, this is also a symptom that can come from any type of constipation and is not particular to qi deficiency constipation. So I'm not sure why this would be special a special key symptom for qi deficiency constipation. 
a feeling of exhaustion afterwards, thin, long stool, which is not dry, pale complexion, tiredness, the tongue is pale, the pulse is empty, blood deficiency constipation, dry stool, difficulty defecating, again a very redundant symptom, dull, pale complexion, dizziness, numbness of the limbs, blurred vision, the tongue is pale or normal, the pulse is empty, so clearly the tongue can't help us differentiate between qi deficiency or blood deficiency, constipation, nor can the uh, difficulty defecating. Okay, then yang deficiency, constipation, difficulty defecating. Exhaustion and sweating after defecation, the stools are not dry, they're sore back and knees, feeling of cold, frequent pale urination, the tongue is pale and wet, the pulse is deep and weak. The patterns that apply to Anne, so Anne signs from a heat pattern are heat at night, red dots on the sides and tip of the tongue, and dry stool. And signs from the chi stagnation pattern, irritability, abdominal distension and fullness, and poor appetite. And signs from chi deficiency pattern are tiredness. And signs from blood deficiency pattern are dry stool. And and sign from the yang deficiency pattern is feeling cold and deep, weak pulses. So this shows us that, wow, it's really hard to find Anne by going to the book and looking for her pattern because she's got signs and symptoms that seem to run the gamut of patterns. Given that Anne's signs and symptoms run the gamut of all of these patterns, we can see why it's really difficult to diagnose, why we might feel like we don't know how to diagnose when we are actually taught that this is how we diagnose, that going to find our patient in a book is the right thing to do, that we there's a reason why we end up feeling so confused, and it's not because our patient is super confusing, and it's not because we are not very good practitioners. It's because this method doesn't work. So some questions you might have after going through this is, if she's yang deficient, why isn't her tongue pale? If she's blood deficient, why is her menstruation full? And why is her complexion so rosy? Also, why does she have diarrhea some of the time? If she has chi stagnation, why aren't her stools pebble-like? What about yin deficiency, since she has night sweats? So when we're attempting to come to a diagnosis, given all of this, we might kind of weigh things out, you know, just, well, is it more of this or more of that, and make a choice as we're weighing things out. We might just kind of grok the diagnosis, what makes sense. We might then sort of use our intuition, and we might make a case for our diagnosis, sort of decide on a diagnosis, and then sort of push the signs and symptoms towards that diagnosis, as we saw with the previous case. But either way, we're not going to have a diagnosis that we feel really confident about. And we'll probably do some other things like make a formula that covers our bases um, or diagnose her with everything. Some of these other things we do when we don't know how to diagnose. So we want to see where this method actually leaves us and that going to the book to try to find our patient is something we do because we weren't trained to actually diagnose. So here I want to show you how we could make a case for a variety of different diagnoses for Anne. For example, we could make a case for qi and yang deficiency. She's tired, she has a poor appetite, she sometimes has a loose stool with undigested food. She has a deep, weak pulse. She has spotting. She feels cold. We can make a good case for qi and yang deficiency. In that case, what's recommended in the book is to use 
Huang Chi Tang. Let's make a case for blood deficiency. She has dry school stool, she has dry skin, late menses, she's tired, she has a thin, deep pulse, cold hands and feet. Okay, we could make a case for blood deficiency. In that case, the book recommends Run Chong Wan. Let's see if we can make a case for chi stagnation. I bet we can. She's got PMS with irritability, fullness and distension in the abdomen, late menstruation, cold hands and feet. It's convincing, isn't it? In that case, the book recommends Liu Mo Yin. All I can say is Oi Vei. And I hope this shows that when we get confused by going to the book and trying to find our patient, it's because it's really confusing. It's not clear. And it's not because we're not very good at finding our patient. It also shows we really were not taught how to diagnose. I bet you can even go through Anne's case and you could make a good case for a heat pattern. So what is Anne's diagnosis? How would we do that? So I'm not going to go through how I would diagnose Anne, but I'll give you a hint, which is that I would do it the same way I did with case one. I would go over each sign and symptom and I would ask, what does this sign tell me for sure? And then I would look at what I know for sure. And then for symptoms, for example, constipation or alternating constipation and diarrhea, I would see, how do I explain the fact that Anne has constipation with what I know for sure? So that could be an exercise you could work on. And in a future presentation, we'll go over Anne's case and actually diagnose it and see what kind of formula we would give Anne. So while you're waiting for that, see what you come up with. Another point about going to the book to try to find our patient is that there is not a limit of six or eight possible patterns for someone with constipation. There are many patterns that can explain why somebody would be constipated. When I say many patterns, I mean many formula patterns. Formulas all the way from Guajertong to Tao He Chung Chi Tong to Ling Gui Jugan Tong. Constipation can show up for all of those patterns and many more. So actually dividing a symptom up into a limited number of patterns will always leave us wanting. What we actually need to do is figure out what the pattern is for that particular patient and then explain how that pattern causes them to have constipation. So what I'm saying is that the way the books are organized is actually a bit ass backwards. So the next thing that we might do when we don't know how to diagnose is just focus on parts of the signs and symptoms, parts of what we gather through the intake and give a formula for that and ignore other parts of it. Now, this case is one that I found on a forum. So I read lots of forums and involve myself in discussions about uh, diagnosis and help with cases. And so I've, I've gathered some cases that I've seen on forums here to show what we do when we don't know how to diagnose. And all of these things are actually extremely common and you might recognize yourself in this case as something that uh, you might do. So here is the case. I have an 18 year old female patient who has had constant headaches for the last five years. She has seen all the Western docs, had all the tests done, nothing is conclusive. Her neurologist referred her for acupuncture. Her history is most interesting. Prior to her headaches, she had a bout of mononucleosis at age 13, followed by removal of her tonsils. After the surgery, her headaches started. One of the things I'm wondering is whether it might be a long-lasting side effect of the anesthesia. 
On her first visit, she appeared morose, depressed, lethargic, extremely ghastly pale. She wears sunglasses and a hat indoors because light aggravates her headaches. Headaches are also aggravated by exposure to humid weather and cold, damp weather. Other symptoms include achy joints in her hands and fingers, knees and hips, which also worsen with the same kinds of weather that aggravates the headaches. Other complaints also included difficulty sleeping, restless tossing and turning, profound fatigue and loss of appetite. In addition, her hands and feet were extremely cold and damp, with her abdomen feeling burning hot and sweaty on palpation. Note that she wore gloves and thermal underwear underneath her clothes and a heavy jacket on an 85 degree day. Yes, she complained of feeling cold all the time. Acupuncture treatments have not impacted her headache in the slightest. She has been a vegetarian most of her life and has not eaten any red meat since age three. Her muscles are very weak and droopy without shape or vigor. She has an issue about eating anything that has eyes. She's thirsty all the time. There are no complaints about digestion, defecation, or urination. Her MDs have suggested that she might have Epstein-Barr or fibromyalgia or mono in her bones. Last spring, she had a rare form of pneumonia caused by chlamydia in her lungs, which caused her to lose a great deal of weight. She was severely ill for five months before coming to see me. She had been gaining 10 pounds per month prior to the pneumonia, with no cause diagnosable by her doctors. Her mother claimed she had not increased her food intake. Her tongue was pale pink with a slightly red tip and sides and a wet, thin, sticky yellow coat. Her pulse is weak and fine on the right and soft and weak on the left, medium depth at 70 beats per minute. She has dark circles under her eyes. Before having mono, she says her health was great. Her headaches are mostly on the right temporal vertex region of her head and slightly on the left side also. They are there all the time, varying only in severity. At their most severe, her right eyelid droops and her vision in her right eye is impaired. I've diagnosed her with a Shaoyang disorder along with spleen qi deficiency, generating dampness, and kidney qi deficiency. <clears throat> there is also a Wei qi deficiency. I'm not sure about the latent pathogen axis. I've given her two different herbal formulas, Sunni San, for the possibility that she did have heat constrained in the interior all this time, as reflected by her hot abdomen with her cold hands and feet. The coldness in her hands and feet improved only slightly with this formula. I also gave her Tong Chao Fu Shui Tong for the headache, on the basis that any five-year headache would have stagnant blood as part of its disharmony. The headache did not change with this formula. I'm now looking into Xiao Chai Hu Tong and am wondering if there's something I am missing. Okay, here I want to look more closely at what this practitioner uh, said. Without really questioning her diagnosis for now, um, we look at what her diagnosis is and then we see what her treatments are. So her treatment, her first treatment was consideration was Sinisan. Now, if we look back at the diagnosis, we think, what is Sinisan for? It's for uh, depressive qi. It opens up the liver qi, opens up the Shaoyang qi. And that was actually not part of her diagnosis. So she just took a part of the symptom picture and went to a formula for a part of the symptom picture, really ignoring the whole diagnosis. The next formula she decided to give was Tong Chao Ho Shui Tang. And if you notice in her diagnosis, she doesn't have blood stasis, blood stasis in the channels as part of her diagnosis. And so again, she's taking one part of the intake that this person has chronic headaches and giving a formula for that. So it's not uncommon at all that someone would go through a whole intake and come up with a diagnosis, but then just give a formula for one part of the symptom picture, completely ignoring the diagnosis. So now um, she, her final formula 
was Xiao Chai Hu Tong for a Xiaoyang disorder, and at least that was part of her diagnosis. Again, I don't agree with her diagnosis based on the intake, but at least there's some continuity between her diagnosis and that treatment consideration. However, her diagnosis is fairly complex. And so what about the other parts of the diagnosis? So Xiao Chai Hu Tong only matches one little part of her complete diagnosis. And again, this is um, because we don't know how to diagnose. We don't know what to do with all of that information. So that's what we want to try to uh, discover in this program is how do we process all of that information. Now in this slide we're looking at some responses to this query. Again it was on a forum so people responded. So one response was without actually seeing the patient your description leads me to a primarily deficient condition diagnosis. Spleen, kidney, yang, qi deficiency leading to cold, damp, phlegm obstruction. Treatment, warm the spleen and kidney yang to drain damp and clear phlegm obstruction and give modified bujong ichi tang. Um, so bujong ichi tang um, is a formula that treats a part of that. It treats the spleen and it lifts the spleen but it doesn't really um, do anything to supplement the kidney yang or clear phlegm obstruction. Now this person did say to modify it. Um, and uh, for me also, just the spleen and kidney yang deficiency uh, with cold, damp phlegm, it really only takes such a small part of what was going on in that intake and ignores uh, a whole lot of the signs and symptoms. And then somebody else wrote in, because of the cold feet and warm abdomen, so there's some uh, cold below and heat above, a harmonizing strategy may be in order. The formula that comes to mind is Ban Xia Xie Xin Tong, or Huang Lian Tong. So there are many harmonizing formulas, and so this formula does, it is a harmonizing strategy for heat above and cold below. However, does it actually fit the pattern? So it's again a very simplified, you know, there's heat above, cold below, give bansha shishintang without really looking at this particular case, which in my opinion, bansha shishintang doesn't fit this case at all. So what we want to see is this, um, when we don't know how to diagnose, how we sometimes throw formulas at a part of what's going on because we don't have a complete diagnosis or we don't know what to do with a complete diagnosis. So the practitioner originally had um, a, a relatively complete diagnosis, so how do we treat that whole picture? in a clear way. Because we don't know how to do that, we just pick parts of it and throw formulas at those parts. And we will never get good results this way. Okay, here's a case that illustrates how often we just skip the diagnosis and go right to treatment. This is a really interesting case. I got it listening to a lecture by uh, an experienced herbalist and he was teaching other very experienced herbalists. So he gave this case out in the class and then asked the practitioners what they thought. And all of them gave formulas without having a diagnosis. So before even going to a diagnosis, they started thinking about formulas. So let's look at this case. One week previous had a big meal, including milkshake, then constipated for three days. She took some bao he wan for food stagnation, which led to small watery bowel movement, but no sense of relief. Then she takes senna and again has the same kind of stool. Two days after that, she came to the clinic. Exam, no abdominal pain. Abdomen is cold, especially lower abdomen. The abdomen feels full, but not painful. Generally chilled, poor sleep. Tongue slightly swollen with whitish, 
almost gray moss. The tongue is tongue body is pale red, i.e. normal. The pulse on the right is wiry with reasonable strength. The left is weaker, deeper, and slightly slow. Before going on to what different practitioners suggested here, let's just look at what the diagnosis is and we'll do this diagnosis in the way that we've already introduced in this presentation, which is that we look at each symptom for what it tells us for sure. So constipation, the stool not moving, cold abdomen, cold in the abdomen, full abdomen, fullness in the middle, chilled is cold, poor sleep is the shen not settling, and a swollen tongue with white gray moss is cold damp. So we'll put this together in a diagnosis and see what the successful treatment was for this patient. But before that, let's look at what the uh, practitioners did. So as we go through this, we want to look at the logic behind these suggestions. Because each practitioner had a way of thinking about this that had some logic to it. What we want to see is that we can have ideas that might seem logical, but they might be very wrong. So the first practitioner said, use Guajir with Liu Junzetong and Dafu Pi and Mu Xiang. Guajir because it's an external invasion. Okay, so first of all, Guajir. We can see that Guajir actually might be good because it's warm not because it's an external invasion. So here's a misunderstanding about what an external invasion actually is. Here the food went into the stomach that was very cold and caused cold in the stomach and that's actually not the exterior. The exterior is the surface of the body, not the interior of the body. So there's some misunderstanding for this practitioner. Now Leo Junzetong is a formula that is primarily, the foundation of it is Sijin Zetong, which is primarily for uh, deficiency and some dampness. There's not anything in here to actually warm, but we can see how somebody would come to this. You know, they see that there's a, a kind of thickish white coating on the tongue um, and some extra moss on the tongue, and so Leo Junzetong might take that, take care of that. It's definitely in the middle warmer, so why not tonify the spleen? And then we can add Dafu Pi and Mushan because there's some stagnation. But again, there's not a foundational diagnosis here, and this treatment would probably not work. Okay, the next person said, because of the pulse and the tongue, there's liver invading spleen. So I'm not sure how the tongue would indicate that the liver is invading the spleen. The pulse is wiry actually on the right. So that doesn't actually indicate that the liver is invading the spleen. Um, and why the pulse would be like that is something that we could talk about in the course. Um, but we want to explain the pulse with what we know for sure. Like how does that cold damp in the stomach large intestine explain a wiry pulse on the right, and it does. Um, but given that this was the diagnosis, and here they didn't skip the diagnosis, they just went, they made a diagnosis of liver invading spleen and gave chai hu shu gan tang. Um, and if you have kidney yang deficiency, use some warm herbs like du jong. So first of all, du jong isn't warm, it's neutral. And secondly, we don't just want to look at an herb that is in the kidney yang chapter of, for, of the Materia Medica. We want to look at its temperature and also what its functions are. So dujong, what that does is it actually supplements the kidney chi and strengthens the back and calms the fetus. It actually doesn't warm at all, especially it doesn't warm the digestion. So we just want to look at this confusion, and for me, the confusion stems from not having a clear diagnosis, a clear and accurate diagnosis, and that's because we don't know how to diagnose. All of these are practitioners of Chinese herbal medicine. They're already 
practicing Chinese herbal medicine. So it sort of gives you an idea of the state of things. Okay, so the next practitioner suggested the use of Yue Juan. Now Yue Juan is for five kinds of stagnation in the digestion. So you can see how Yue Juan would be a logical choice. But again, it actually doesn't relate to the diagnosis of cold damp in the large intestine. So Yue Juan is not an accurate pill, but we want to be able to see the logic of the Yue Juan and see how we kind of jump to formulas based on symptoms without having them relate to the diagnosis. So the final practitioner gave a formula suggestion that's probably the closest to an accurate diagnosis. He recommended Liang Fu Wan. And Liang Fu Wan is a Gao Liang Jiang with Xiang Fu. And so we can see that that's actually warming the middle warmer. It is a pill to warm in order to stop pain, and there isn't abdominal pain in this case. So it's got that little bit of lack of accuracy there. And then because it was constipation, he said, add some da huang and some food stasis herbs. This is also something that we do when we don't know how to diagnose is we sort of add things for different parts of the symptomatology rather than seeing the root cause of the symptomatology. So finally, here I have the actual treatment that was given that was very successful. And the treatment was, you can see, sunitong. And sunitong will warm the middle warmer, and Futsa, in addition to tonifying the yang, also expels cold. And here, there isn't yang deficiency, but there is excess cold. So the Futsa and Ganjong together will expel the cold. Now, the, the reason for the constipation is the cold. So cold will just shut down function. And so rather than doing anything to move the stool, when you warm the belly, the intestinal peristalsis will just start on its own. And so the uh, person who was giving this lecture said, this was my treatment, it was based on my diagnosis, and it was very effective. So we can see from this also that we can also come to the correct diagnosis when we look at the symptoms for what they tell us for sure, rather than jumping to conclusions about the symptoms or just treating symptoms without a diagnosis. I think that this uh, is also very interesting in terms of uh, looking at what practitioners who have completed a full education and are now practicing herbalists how they come to their conclusions. So this is what we want to work with in the graduate mentorship program is really being able to diagnose. And this case is actually relatively simple and straightforward. So what do we do when we have more complex cases? It's the same method, looking at symptoms for what they tell us for sure and allowing the diagnosis to reveal itself. Here's another case in which the diagnosis is skipped and the practitioners go right to treatment. This case is actually from a text compiled by Leo Dujo in which doctors are using classic formulas from the Shanghan Lun to treat illness. And this case was offered in a lecture and then the person giving the lecture asked the participants in the lecture to give their thoughts about the case and then he went on to say what the doctor actually did. So again, the, the diagnosis is skipped by these practitioners and they go straight to treatment ideas. 
So the patient was a 30-year-old woman with a 10-year history of dysmenorrhea, which had increased in severity with each passing year. For one to three days prior to her period, she would experience severe intermittent pain or distending pain in the lower abdomen. The pain was difficult to bear and would continue through the second or third day of her menstrual flow, at which point she would pass some membranous material and the pain would greatly decrease. The dysmenorrhea was accompanied by distending pain in the breasts and rib sides. Her menstrual blood was dull and contained clots. Exposure to cold made the pain worse and warmth made it slightly better. During the most recent period, the abdominal pain was severe, her emotional state was poor, there was distension in the lower abdomen, her lower limbs lacked warmth, her extremities tended to be cold, and she disliked cold. Her lower abdomen was typically cold and distended. She reported copious vaginal discharge that was thin and clear. Her pulse was string-like and slow. Her tongue was dull with white fur. The patient had previously tried Tao Hong, Su Tong, and Xiao Ya San without good effect. So let's first look at these formulas, Tao Hong, Su Tong. We can understand the logic of Tao Hong, Su Tong because we know for sure that there's blood stasis. And so Tao Hong, Su Tong treats blood stasis. However, there isn't a diagnosis. So down below I wrote the diagnosis, which is cold blood stasis in the lower warmer slash womb. Now when the blood is static due to cold, there's no way that that blood will move unless you warm. It just won't move unless you warm the blood. And so Tao Hong Su Tong was right in some ways, but again, without a good diagnosis, then you won't get the formula right. And then Xiaoyasan was tried. Now the Xiaoyasan, we can also understand the logic because when we're in school, we learn that when there's blood stagnation, there's qi stagnation, that the qi moves the blood, and therefore, if we want to move the blood, we have to move the qi. However, blood can be stagnant for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons could be qi stagnation. In this case, there are no signs of qi stagnation as the cause of the blood stasis, so Xiaoyasan wouldn't work. In addition, if the blood stasis is due to qi stasis, you need both the qi regulating herbs as well as the blood vitalizing herbs. Just regulating the qi won't have a significant effect. So we can understand the logic of Xiaoyasan, but again, without a clear diagnosis, those kinds of formulas will not be effective. So the diagnosis is cold blood stasis in the lower warmer and womb. Now we'll look at some of the formulas that the practitioners suggested. So again, let's keep in mind that these are all practitioners who have graduated from herbal programs and who are practicing. And uh, for me, this really shows me the state of things in terms of how people are practicing, and mostly that people did not learn how to diagnose. So the first person said, how about Sheng Hua Tang with Ho Po, Qing Pi, and Mu Xiang? So let's look at this. Sheng Hua Tang, it is a formula for somewhat warming the blood, but it's also a formula that's for postpartum blood stasis in order to clear away the old and generate the new, and it's not strong in its warming qualities and not very strong actually in its moving qualities. And the way that Sheng Hua Tang actually moves is in a purging way with very, very slight warming. And again, that idea that if there's blood stasis, there must be qi stasis, which I think is uh, ubiquitous in our, t ubiquitously taught in our schools. So adding Ho Po, Qing Pi, and Mu Shang to regulate the Qi as well. 
but again in this case there really were no signs of qi stasis. So the next person said, how about Jingwei Shenqiwan? So they were noticing that there was cold, but Jingwei Shenqiwan is actually a very supplementing formula for the kidney yang, and it doesn't have any effect on the blood. And it's actually not a particularly warming formula. In order to be very warming, you need herbs like wujuyu or ganjang. So the next person said, how about guijer plus chai hu suutong? Again, that idea that if there's blood stasis, there's qi stasis. So we'll use suutong to move the blood plus chai hu to regulate the qi. And okay, there's cold, so let's add guijer as well. So we can again understand the logic here, but actually there's barely anything to really bring warmth into the blood in order to really stop this pain. So none of these are quite on target. So the next thing we do when we don't know how to diagnose is decide a diagnosis ignoring the intake. This is incredibly common. If you read cases in forums, you'll see how many people write up a whole intake and then have a diagnosis that's completely disconnected from the actual intake. So here's an example of that. I have a patient who's two, very alert and bright, sunny disposition, seems easily bored. He was breastfed for about three months and had all regular immunizations. Only one instance of an ear infection diagnosed early three months with food allergies, later with environmental allergies and asthma. Manifests few symptoms, has never had an asthmatic attack. He often has bronchial congestion and gets colds and runny nose. His eyes have good shen and there's no collapses of energy. There are no clear signs of phlegm or heat or deficiency. No observable finger vein rash is itchy, skin dry, and eczema looks like patches of reptilian skin, primarily on the lower extremities, with occasional small patches on the ventral aspect of the wrist. This is redder than the surrounding area, but no visible sign of exudates. Marked itchy dandruff. He has, he's strong with good energy and appetite, BM one to two times a day, constipated on rare occasions, no unusual color on the face, Parents moisturize his skin every two hours with aquaphor when he is at home. Occasional use of hydrocortisone at home and at daycare. Cervical chain lymph nodes visible at a distance. So one thing I would like you to notice is that he says there are no clear signs of phlegm or heat or deficiency. So first, I agree that there are no clear signs of deficiency, but I definitely see signs of phlegm and heat. So I'm not sure where this idea came from. He has a red rash. He also has a runny nose and bronchial congestion. So both of these are signs of heat and or phlegm. So keeping it in mind that he said there are no cases of phlegm or heat, we go on. He's generally warm, kicks the covers off at night. Eczema is exacerbated by the sun. So why did he say there's no signs of heat? Interesting. Plays outside at daycare for an hour per day, asphalt, dirt, grass, wears long pants except when sleeping, good appetite, vegan diet, diagnosed allergic to wheat, milk, corn, peanuts, plus a couple of other things. His mother consumed the allergic foods during pregnancy also diagnosed with environmental allergies. TV limited to half hour per day, pulse rapid, but not in excess of 110 to 120, possibly slippery, tongue quite red, again, another really clear heat sign, neither excessively wet nor dry, deep center crack that extends to the lung area, but not to the tip. His initial diagnosis was LPF, lingering pathogenic factor, with damp heat and spleen and lung 
chi deficiency. We began with advising the parents to eliminate all known food allergens and ways to reduce environmental issues at home. So this diagnosis, um, ignoring the intake and just deciding on a diagnosis. So first, the diagnosis of lingering pathogenic factor. For me, that is a very vague diagnosis that actually is um, a symptom of a practitioner that doesn't know how to diagnose. Because when we don't know how to diagnose, we use very vague language that doesn't really say anything. You might think that lingering pathogenic factor says something, but if you think that the diagnosis should lead us to a clear treatment, then you realize that it doesn't really tell us anything because it doesn't lead us to any kind of treatment. It doesn't tell us what the pathogenic factor is or where it is in the body. So then he goes on to say damp heat. And it's interesting because there are zero signs of damp heat that I can see. No signs of damp heat at all. There are signs of phlegm in the lungs and heat but those have not mingled into damp heat. And then he was right, there were no signs of deficiency and yet his diagnosis comes to spleen and lung chi deficiency with zero signs of deficiency. Then, so here we, we can see that the diagnosis was decided upon without taking the actual intake into account. Then when we get to the beginning of the treatment, it's, ad it's advising the parents to eliminate food allergens. So, you know, it's one thing we do when we don't know how to diagnose is go to other modalities because we don't really have the confidence that um, we could actually treat this kid's eczema effectively um, and even treat his ability to eat all these different foods. We don't really have that confidence from my point of view, the reason we don't have that confidence is because we don't know how to diagnose. So how could we de develop that confidence? So watch in our, your own practice. When do you sort of decide a diagnosis and it ignores your intake? The next thing we do because we don't know how to diagnose is that we come to Chinese medical conclusions based on Western medical diagnosis. Some examples of conclusions we draw that are often quite wrong are that a low basal body temperature in the luteal phase is kidney yang deficiency. And actually in terms of the basal body temperature, there's really a whole science of using uh, the temperature to come to Chinese medical conclusions, which I think uh, really diminishes our results working with fertility and habitual miscarriage patients. But diabetes is yin deficiency, hypertension is liver yang rising, that antibiotics cause dampness, catching colds easily is a way qi deficiency, infections are heat, high FSH is kidney yin deficiency. So these are just a few of the kinds of conclusions that we draw based on a Western diagnosis. Sometimes we'll go to obscure classics to look for hints about what the diagnosis might be. Here's an example from Giovanni Macciocci's book on diagnosis. These are the indications based on different kinds of dreams we might have. So to me, there's nothing wrong with this kind of information. However, what I like to do is base my diagnosis on the signs and symptoms that tell me something for sure, which the dreams don't, and then look and see how the diagnosis might be affecting the dreams. And indeed, in cases of a lot of excess heat, there are often dreams of fire, and there are dreams of floods with a lot of fear when there's an excess of yin. However, we can't go the other way around and say that dreams of floods and fear always means an excess of yin.
is a response from the form to the previous case. So again, remember that this response is from somebody who practices Chinese medicine, and the forum is a Chinese medical forum. So this person said the, uh, the EFA deficiency could well be a major factor here. That's essential fatty acids for which herbal formulas would be relatively ineffective. Commercial flaxseed oil is often rancid. It spoils extremely rapidly, begins to significantly degrade within 15 minutes of extraction. Also, flaxseed oil is not an adequate source of EFAs for most people, as the conversion rate for ALA, EPA, and DHA. I'm not sure even what that means, but what I want to point out here is just that um, when we don't have the ability to diagnose, we don't actually think that herbs can treat things, and we tend to go to other modalities. Another response to this same case, someone said, I would suggest using cannabis seed oil. And then the third response was, evening primrose oil is high in omega-6 fatty acids. What would what the patient needs as well as a source of omega-3 fatty acids if EPA is unacceptable off the top of my head is perilla seeds. High in omega-3 but I'm not sure where it is in the metabolic chain or whether it needs delta-6 desaturase to be converted to more anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. Here's an example of something that might more likely happen in our practices. Often when we don't know how to diagnose, we think, if I can just learn more of these minute details, I will get better at diagnosis. And this is an error. Learning more and more about these minute details will just add more stuff into your brain that is completely not helpful. So this example, um, where we're encouraged to look at minute details and misled by them, is taken from the text, The Practice of Chinese Medicine by Giovanni Macioccia. And he writes, stools which are round and small, like pebbles, indicate heat if they are very dry, or liver chi stagnation if they are not dry. Long and thin stools, like pencils, indicate spleen chi deficiency. So this is actually completely inaccurate. Spleen chi deficiency can actually create hard, dry, pebble-like stools. I've seen it happen. You have to be able to really diagnose spleen chi deficiency and then ask, how does this spleen chi deficiency explain why their stools are hard and dry like pebbles? And it can happen. I've also seen thin, stools that are due to liver chi stagnation or a bancha shishin tong type of pattern, um, a whole variety of patterns. In fact, the same pattern in the same formula could treat hard pebble-like stools, and in another person that same formula could treat long, thin stools that look like pencils. So these kinds of minute details are always something we want to explain with our diagnosis and not use these details to actually come to a diagnosis. Another example might be difficulty sleeping. We learn in school that if you have trouble going to sleep, it's heart blood deficiency, and if you have difficulty staying asleep, it's yin deficiency. That is completely wrong and will only mislead you. And there, so we have an idea, if I can understand these kinds of details, then I'll be able to diagnose. And it's not true. Instead, we want to have the ability to come to our diagnosis, and then from that diagnosis explain why someone has difficulty sleeping. And for me, I've seen people with blood deficiency that have a hard time going to sleep, and people with blood deficiency who are wakeful in the night. So. Those kinds of minute details are always things we should explain with our diagnosis and not 
things that we should use to come to our diagnosis. And studying more and more minute details will not get you to be better at diagnosis. So another thing that we do when we don't know how to diagnose is diagnosing a patient with everything. And again, here is a case that somebody submitted to a forum. And we can see so many symptoms with so many decisions about those symptoms. But it's interesting to see as you go through the symptoms, do you agree with her interpretation of that symptom? For me, most of the time, I don't. So anyway, this person's major complaint is constant lethargy with bouts of weakness, ovary removed, 1991, cervical cancer, 1986. She's had this condition for two and a half months. Metal type may suffer illness in spring and summer. Non-pitting edema, chi or blood stagnation, clear thin phlegm, cold pattern, red face, heat in the blood, thinner, thinner eminence red, heat, tongue spirit like a fresh piece of meat, good spirit, Tongue color, red without coating, deficient heat, cracked, yin deficient, long thin midline, constitutional heart deficiency, intent to emotional problem, tongue coating, thin coating without root, weakening stomach chi, tongue moisture, dry tongue in four level illnesses, red with no coating, yin level, slight dizziness with a feeling of heaviness in the head, phlegm, slight dizziness worse when tired, deficient chi or blood, clear urine, cold in the bladder, or a kidney yang deficiency, scanty urination, accumulated heat in the bladder, restless sleep with dreams, disharmony between heart and kidney, sometimes early, sometimes late period, liver chi stagnation, liver blood stasis, spleen deficiency, kidney deficiency, dry skin deficiency of liver blood. And look, it goes on and it goes on and on and on with all of these disease factors based on these symptoms. In this slide, the practitioner put this all together, and this is her diagnosis, this whole thing. Intact stomach chi, inflammation, fever or infection, spleen deficiency, dampness or both, may suffer illness in spring, summer, chi or blood stagnation, cold pattern, heat in the blood, heat, good spirit, deficient heat, yin deficient, constitutional heart deficiency, tend to emotional problems, weakening stomach chi. So she goes through all of the conclusions that she drew based on the symptoms. In an effort to consolidate this, she counted things up. There are five cold signs, 10 heat signs, 17 deficient, no excess. There are four damp signs, but the mouth is dry. There's one phlegm sign. All organs appear to have some involvement, spleen, stomach, bladder, kidney, heart, liver, and even the uterus. However, there are more liver signs than any other treatment, any other. The treatment principle, I'm gonna treat this as a deficiency, heat in the first few treatments, and also try to harmonize the liver. So with all of those diagnoses, it comes down to Liu Wei Di Huang Wan and Xu Gang Tian. So diagnosing the patient with everything. Another thing we do when we don't know how to diagnose is use vague language. So it's good to notice when you are using vague language about what's going on with your patient and just think, does this mean that I'm actually not very clear about this? So things like the, lip, the patient has liver stuff going on, they're very spleeny, they have lingering pathogen. Another thing would be they have kidney stuff with adrenal deficiency, those kinds of things um, may indicate that you don't know how to diagnose. When we don't know how to diagnose, it can make us very insecure about giving herbs to people because we know that the herbs really do affect people. So sometimes we might give formulas to cover our bases just in case. And there are even patent formulas that I consider cover your formula formulas. And they are also formulas that are very effective for calming the spirit of an insecure practitioner. So we can give these formulas and know that we're probably not gonna do harm, but we're probably gonna have 
pretty bad results as well. So we can look at this con formula, Compassion and Sage, and see how many treatment principles this formula covers. It nourishes the blood to calm the spirit. It uses minerals to settle and calm. It clears phlegm to calm the spirit. It drains damp to calm the spirit. It opens the orifices to calm the spirit. Regulates the chi to calm the spirit. Vitalizes the blood to calm the spirit. Clears heat to calm the spirit. Nourishes the blood to calm, calm the spirit. Just everything. So it's a very unfocused treatment. So notice when you want to give a formula that's kind of covering your bases as an indication, maybe you're not clear on the diagnosis. The final four things we're going to look at here are we may treat too conservatively because we lack confidence. So, so many practitioners are afraid to use herbs and give very uh, mild, not very uh, strong or effective formulas, and we avoid using herbs like da huang or ma huang or fu zi because we're not clear about the diagnosis. When we're clear about the diagnosis, we can confidently use herbs that we might be afraid to lose, use if we're not confident. So if you find yourself treating conservatively because you're a little afraid, think about, am I really clear on my diagnosis? Of course we want to be conservative as we build experience and we don't want to be flippant about using strong herbs. But we don't want that conservative uh, treatment to be because we don't know our diagnosis. We want that conservative treatment to be only because we don't know how the herbs work with our own clinical experience yet. We are clear on our diagnosis so we can start using the correct herbs in a conservative way and then we can up our dosages to an effective dose as we see what the results are. But the, if we treat conservatively and avoid the correct treatment because we don't feel confident in our diagnosis, we actually will never learn to be better practitioners. We also may resort to really simplistic diagnosis and treatment. We might blame the patient, you know, say something like they, they just aren't committed enough. Um, and or they don't they don't take good enough care of themselves they still haven't quit drinking coffee or they're still eating wheat and that's why they're not getting better um, and you know so often I've seen that it could be very much the incorrect diagnosis at, as the foundation for why somebody is not getting better and yet um, the patients get blamed and for me, the saddest thing, we get discouraged about Chinese medicine. You know, we spend a lot of money and a lot of time on our educations, and then we have, you know, so-so results in our clinics, and we start to wonder, maybe this medicine isn't very powerful. And that is really unfortunate because it is an incredibly powerful uh, medicine. And when we have good diagnostic skills, what we can accomplish is really quite amazing and really fun. So better to really look at the fact that we were not taught to diagnose and then think how can I learn to diagnose so that I can really skillfully apply this medicine rather than get discouraged about the medicine. And probably the saddest is that we get discouraged about our own abilities, our own intelligence, even our own worth. Sometimes students have talked to me about feeling like frauds, feeling guilty charging money. So all of this coming from the fact that we don't know how to diagnose. And to remember, it's not our fault. We were not taught how to diagnose. So in the graduate mentorship program, we will be learning how to diagnose. We've given some um, hints here about the method that we use to come to a diagnosis that's based in what we know for sure and not a, uh, a supposition. 
So hopefully you will be joining us.